Wow, it's great to be here. What a great day to be at Park City's Baptist Church. Amen. Some of you, we got grandparents, we got aunts and uncles and different uh, ones here for the babies. And we had baptism earlier. So much going on. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to have baptism. If you've not been baptized, we can talk about that later on as well. But so many good things. I just got back from South Texas, in fact, on a men's mission trip um, just yesterday. We were down there for a few days. A lot of uh, really cross-generational group of men, but a lot of men, a lot of young men. We even had some sons who were serving with us and working with us, pulled out of school. You know, they thought that was good. But um, doing the deal. And just among men, we, we were doing construction, building beds and taking them to families who otherwise kids are sleeping on the floor in the Colonias. We're sharing the gospel. We saw a lot of, um, we, were, we were with a bunch of students who at, at UTRGV, uh, Rio Van Grali, like 30,000 students there. Um, and we got to speak um, and saw kids and students come to Christ. Um, we saw uh, just families who were so blessed by our men praying over them and working. And um, wow, I, I could go on and on. While we were there, not one man said, Jeff, bro, why are you wearing those shoes? It's after Labor Day, bro. <laughs> nobody, nobody said that. Nobody offered that. We, we just did man stuff, you know. And when I say we um, did the construction you know, we all have our part. You know what I'm saying? We all do our part. And I, I, I worked construction um, out of high school, between high school, college, and then another summer or two, three maybe, and right after, in between. And so I know, I know what's up. I know how to swing a hammer. Um, but you, you don't want me building your house. Like, you don't. Um, so we go help guys who know what they're doing. And um, you don't even really want me to do landscaping. Um, like I'm not, I've learned this summer, I'm not a gardener. I just not, don't know what I'm doing. Um, and do you have any gardeners here? Anybody like gardening or, or plants or anything like that? We have, people are pointing at other people. <laughs> like you're, some of you are like me, like, so we have three, uh, here and so, but some of you, some people find it therapeutic, right? Like you love this, like get your hands in there and the dirt and I'm, but here's what I've learned in my failure. I've learned that it takes a lot of attention, a lot of focus, a lot of knowledge, frankly, and a lot of care, a lot of endurance and perseverance and patience. And I, I have none of that, like or not for plants. I have it for people, but not plants. And so if I'm so grateful that the Lord um, cares for me in ways that I do not care, or, or I try to care for my plants, but I don't know what I'm doing. So my plants have died and it, all my neighbors are like, Jeff, we, we know you're not a gardener, bro. Like you know, you, we know this, we can see. But um, I say all that because the, the, Probably the primary analogy that Jesus uses when we talk about relationship with him is that of a, a vine that's connected to a branch that's producing fruit. Now, you may have heard this before, may, may know this, but we're going to find it in John 15. I want you to turn to John 15 if you have your Bible, and I hope you bring your Bible. I know a lot of us are on tablets or screens or whatever else. Um, when we read scripture, I'm... Uh, I don't know that it's old school. I just love to open God's word, to be in it. Um, many of you, if you don't have your, your bookmark, uh, here's the application. Don't miss this. Grab yours on the way out. As we're reading God's word, we're in it every day. We get a couple days off in the weekend if you need to make up, but we're in it every day. We're in the word. We're going to talk about that today, why that's so important. But um, I, I've been told, I talked to one of our men, in fact, yeah, yesterday, who um, was telling me, hey, if you, if you ever, and he's, he's into agriculture and such, and he said, you know, when you talk about abiding is what this passage is about, staying in him, remaining connected to the vine. He said, if, if, and some of y'all know this, those who are, and he's talking about vine, uh, grape vines, right? That produce grapes is, is the analogy because that's what they saw all over Israel. And um, they, they made grapes to produce wine. When you talk about that kind of vineyard, when you talk about that kind of vine dresser, you know, who's pruning and cutting away and knowing all the things. You talk about attention to detail. I mean, constant care, constant care for those plants so that they'll produce just the right kinds of grapes and a lot of grapes. 
So there's full on attention to, to that kind of work. And Jesus says that our lives with him are just like that. And it's in this passage that we're going to see this. We've been talking about everyday grace. And this one, gang, I'm so excited about this sermon because I think it brings everything right down to where we are as believers, what it means, how about this, to be a Christian. This, this message is so central to what it is to, to actually walk the Christian life, to be a Christian producing fruit in your life. And so this is, this is it. In fact, I would say this, if you don't follow Jesus teaching here, if you don't apply this verse, these passage, this passage, these verses, you are not a disciple of Jesus. And you'll see why this is so critical. And so some of us need to hear this today and it's going to be convicting for some of us. I'm praying that it'll be the love of God and his spirit that will speak to you. But we want grace for all the major things, forgiveness, salvation, heaven, we need grace every day, and we need to come back to his grace every day, grace in the details. It's appropriating his grace. Once we respond to what he's done to us on the cross, and there's no better passage than this one right here. Now, one of the classes on Wednesday nights is the pastor study. Um, and we had, I don't know, 50, 60 folks who came, but this is one you can drop in on any time. Come join me on Wednesday. We're down in the fellowship hall. There's lots of great classes going on and, and they're for you to grow, to help you become more like Jesus. But one of the things we're talking about, the main thing we're talking about is how to faithfully read God's word because a lot of us don't know how to read God's word. And so it's kind of daunting. And, uh, so we don't. And, and what you need to do is, yes, just dive in, start reading his word because he speaks to us through his word. Are you in the habit? But you can come and join us. One of the things we talk about is context is everything. Because I, I say it this way, the Bible was written, it wasn't written to us. It was written for us. Now think about that. It's translated from other languages. It was translated from Koine Greek, common Greek. So it wasn't written to us, you could argue. And the words, the context matters. Jesus is speaking in this passage. That's important to know. Uh, it's easy. He's speaking to his disciples, which then translates to us. Anybody that wants to be a disciple, listen to what he says. He's also speaking during the upper room discourse. This matters. He's from uh, John 13 all the way to John 17, four chapters. He's, he's in this Kind of, kind of sermon, last moments around the Passover meal and the last uh, first Lord's Supper. And, and he is there. He's talking to them. He's about to die. He's going to the cross the next day. And here in the upper room, he tells them, this is how you're going to remain in me as I'm gone. So the first thing he's going to say is, oh, we all need everyday grace. Every single one of us. And then he's going to talk about three essential things, benefits that come which is the Christian life that come from abiding in him, staying in him, remaining in his love, okay? And we're going to talk about habits that allow us to do that. The entire Christian life is the life of an apprentice of the rabbi, uh, a disciple who is constantly, you're constantly putting yourself in position to hear from him and to obey him, to follow him. And so even your being here today is huge, and you're here because you want to grow in him. So let's dive in. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Again, the original hearers, they're going, we're tracking with you. We know exactly what you're talking about. We just walked by some vineyards just getting here. They know exactly. They're drinking wine that came from the grapes, right? Y'all are Baptists. Y'all don't drink any wine. But anyway, they know what's up. And they're, they're doing this. And, and, and they know exactly what he's talking about. Then we come, this is one of his I am statements, by the way. Um, I am, which is the name Yahweh. We, we talked about this in our a former series on the seven I am statements. He says he's the true vine, which means, now they would have also known this, to be a, to be a, uh, a vine. This is a reference in the Old Testament. The vineyard was Israel, okay? And God, it, Yahweh is the vine dresser. Israel did not produce the kind of grapes they were created and put together to produce. So Jesus steps in. Think about this. I am the true vine. He's saying, I'm here to replace the former one. I'm embodying now in my person the purposes of God in the world. This is a bold statement. 
Then he says in verse two, look at this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he goes straight to the matter at heart. Look at this. I mean, the heart of the matter here. He not, does not bear fruit. He takes away, and every branch that does, does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, look at this. Notice he's pruning the ones that are bearing fruit. And he's also, there's, there's a difference. He's taking away some, cut off and taken away. And we're going to see later here, and then burned. But there's others that he's pruning. He's clipping away. And he says, already you are clean, you're pure, because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, this passage, and it'll go on, it seems that he's, it's kind of confusing. He's repeating himself, it seems, over and over again. Like, wait, you sort of said that. You already said that. Well, you said that differently, but now you're coming at it from another. That's exactly what he's doing. It's actually a rabbinical and pedagogical method of the rabbi, common in his day, where you come back. Let me get back to this. Okay, here's another way to say this. Okay, now I'm coming back. Let's say this again. So it's layer upon layer, and it, so it sounds elementary, but he says, don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. And what he's saying is, notice this, the relationship that you have with Jesus is an organic relationship, okay? It's, it's, a, it, it's to be a fruitful uh, Christian, to live the life, to remain in him means that you, like the plant, right, is attached to the vine, the source of nutrients, soil, water, it will not grow. Cut that thing off, pull it out, and toss it aside. It is now, it is essentially dead. I mean, it's, it's shriveling up and dying. He says you cannot live the Christian life apart from this organic relationship. And, and it, here's what he's after in your life. Friends, don't miss this. And I, want the, I, I pray this is convicting for you. If you claim to be a Christian, you need some clarity here today. Because what he's after in your life is organic change through a new inner dynamic in your life. When you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. It's not a mechanical compliance to rules. This is why we say, Christ, you've heard this, Christianity is not a religion or rules, it's a relationship. What does that look like? It looks exactly like what Jesus is talking about. It's an organic, constant relationship. This is the Christian life. In response to what he's done on the cross, we follow that and say, I am now going to remain in him. I'm a disciple. Look at verse, so, so in verse 2, he's talking about those who've made professions of faith. And he'll get to this again. He'll circle back to this more explicitly. Who, who claim that they're Christians. People who say they're Christians, they don't abide in him. They don't read the word. They don't pray. They don't have a desire to grow. They're not among community, in community. They're not a member of a church. They're not in connect group or a group of people growing. They're not obsessed with God's word. He says, you do not belong to me. This is apostasy we've talked about this past summer. Um, you can go online and find that passage out of Hebrews 6. Apostasy is one who claims that they're a believer. And like, oh, I got baptized. I, I did that. I joined a church years ago. And they're not abiding in him. Proving, here it is, that they do not belong to him. That's what Jesus is saying here. But if you, look, if you're, if you're abiding in him, if you stay in his word... You will not commit apostasy. So it's not a fearful thing for those of us who are growing and love Jesus and are following him. Fruit proves that you belong. And we'll talk, well, what is this fruit? What are we talking about? Let's keep going. Look at verse five. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, look at this, you can do nothing. And again, I check that out in the Greek and really parse that out. Nothing, it means nothing. It means no thing. Now, we, and I say that jokingly because we go, I can do a lot of things without Jesus. I'm like, really? I can, I can go to lunch without Jesus? I can, 
No, no, no. Watch this. There's two things going on here. One, the Bible says in him, through him, for him, to him, all things were made. That includes you. You are breathing today. Right now, your heart is beating in your chest because he created you to function that way. You are not thinking about your heart beating right now. You are not thinking about breathing. He's keeping you a lot. You can do nothing apart from him. So that's one part of it. The other part is he's saying you can't do anything of eternal value, of spiritual value, nothing apart from being connected to the vine, to him. Like the fruit cannot be, you know, grapes aren't going to come if it's not connected to the source This is what he's saying. Are you connected to him? Already, let the spirit just say, come on, I'm I'm here to take it. Lord, speak into my heart. Are you abiding in him? Proving that you belong to him. Are you not? You don't have a passion for his word. You're not in his word daily. You're not seeking him in prayer. Because abide, meno, in the Greek, means to remain. It means to be at home It means to be put, stay put, to be in. You realize you can't live if you're not abiding in him. You do nothing apart from him. How are you doing? Are you abiding in him? And again, you might say, well, how do I do that? Here it is. You establish habits in your life that allow you to get in his presence to hear truth. In a world filled with lies. And you know who's lying to you more than anyone? You are lying to yourself more than anyone else in the world. How do you know the truth? You're in his word. Friends, if he speaks through his word truly, and he does, wouldn't we be in it every day? Wouldn't we be obsessed with knowing it? Wouldn't we be in it multiple times a day? Are you? Because have you figured this out yet? Listen. We often think, most of us think we are captains of our own, you know, destiny. We think that we decide the future. You don't decide your future. You decide your habits and your habits decide your future. Have you figured that out yet? Show me your constant habits in your life daily. I will show you who you're becoming. And if you're in his word daily, I'll I'll show you who you're becoming. If you're praying, if you're seeking, if you're abiding in him, I know what you're becoming. You know what you're becoming? You're becoming like Jesus. I know what that looks like. And that's what each of us, when we say yes to him, that's what we have said yes to. And if some of us thought, man, I just said yes because I want to go to heaven. Like, beam me up. When I die, I'm going to heaven. That's why I came to Jesus. That is not the gospel, friends. And you need to hear this. Here at our church, we are preaching a gospel that makes disciples. That's what Jesus, that's what he's after for us. If, if you think the gospel is, well, I received that, I've been saved, back, I was baptized, and that I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm, and if, if that's all it is, that's apostasy. You're not a believer. I mean, this is a bold statement, but it's true. The gospel that we preach is one that produces disciples. Because here's the thing, friends, listen. Mere forgiveness will not produce disciples. It's a decision. Because if we don't follow him as disciples and understand that he's calling us to be apprentices, if you think that Christianity is just receive him and go to heaven... That's not, what he's, that's not what Jesus is calling you for. He's calling you in to say this. Here it is. He's died on the cross for me. He's forgiven me so that I will follow him anywhere. Now. That's what it is to be a disciple. To follow him every day. And does that describe your life? Are, are you, maybe you're learning something new here. Like, wow, this is, this is getting serious. How do you get out of this dangerous loop? How do you, how do you get out of not, you abide in him. You establish the pattern. Here's the hardest thing for some of us today. What's the application? How about this? Grab a bookmark and dive into the word of God tomorrow. And have others join you and be accountable. And watch God change your life. 
It's abiding in him. Pray. Start habits that put you in position to hear from him every single day. And here's another challenge I have for you. This is a real practical thing. I've talked to several today who've come and said, I want to be baptized. We're having a baptism. Some of you know this. We're having a great church-wide celebration in two weeks. Not next week, but the next. Come ready. We're going to go outside after our services, and we're going to celebrate new life in Christ. And those who've, who've said, I want to proclaim this to everybody. And, and, and you, can, you can talk to us after the service. We'd love to talk to you about that. If you've never been baptized, that's, that's my great challenge for you today. Let the Spirit convict you and to do that. Because, here it is. That's the first step of saying, I'm, I am, I'm now a disciple of Jesus. Not, I receive this, I'm going to heaven someday. No, I am now going to proclaim to the world that I belong to him. I'm convinced many people question their salvation. They, they wonder well, what it really is to follow Jesus, or I think I'm saved, I don't know if I'm saved. And they have no power in their lives because they have never been baptized. They've never said, I'm in. There's no turning back. To be baptized, watch this, is to say, Jesus, apart from you, I can do nothing on my own. That's what baptism is. I die to myself. And I'm raised up to walk in you. I want your spirit to be guiding me. I abide in you. I'm remaining in your love. That's what he's calling, calling us to. So all that to say, every one of us need everyday grace. And now let's parse out three um, three benefits. Okay, real quick. Every grace, everyday grace brings growth. This is what we're all looking for, isn't it? Don't you, you don't want to stay where you are. You want to grow more in faith. This, this is it. Look at verse six. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, uh, and, and, and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Friends, again, this is apostasy. This happens when someone claims or thinks they're a believer and they never grow in Christ. They don't remain in him. They, they don't follow him. They don't pray. They, I, I'd say it this way. Their actions prove that they do not belong to him. Your habits prove that you are not saved. And I know this is, this is challenging, but this is real. And you need to wrestle this to the ground, friends. It's not unlike when I talk to couples, okay? Through the years, I've talked to many couples where there's been some inf infidelity. Someone's been unfaithful. I mean, there, there's been an adulterous relationship. And I've come to this. I'll talk to the, to the spouse. It, and it, it, it could be the man, it could be the woman. Let's say the man has gone off the rails, but he's come back and, he, and, and, and the, his wife is telling Jeff, he's, I mean, he's really remorseful. He's crying, he's crying over it. He's really sad. And he, he wants to do better. And he, he says he's going to do better. And I've come to this, gang. Don't listen to what he says. Watch what he does. Watch what he does. That will prove that he's in and he's going to do whatever he's told to do to get back in the game. And in the same, this is true for all of us across the board. Don't tell me that you are a Christian. You got baptized back in the day. You did whatever. My mama told me, you know, my daddy's faith. No, 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 no. Friends, eternity weighs in the balance here. And then he says this. He says in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, wait, what? If we dwell in his word, we find obedience and bearing fruit to come natural for us, is what he's saying. I could, I, I'd put it this way. If you are abiding in him, you're hearing his word, you're in the Bible, you're saying, I'm going to apply this today. I'm going to live this out. Now you're starting, his desires start to become your desires. How does that happen? Through obedience. How do you remain in him? Through obedience. How, how do you be obedient? Through remaining in him. You see this? It's an organic relationship. It's a partnership. But you've got to put yourself in position to hear from him, and yes, then obey him. And as you do, watch this, it transforms your prayers. Faithful, constant prayer is then 
I am praying according to the will of God because I know what it is. I'm hearing from him. I'm not praying about stuff that doesn't matter. I mean, everything matters, but I'm not praying. I'm not praying for a new car and all that, whatever I want. I'm praying according to the spirit. And when you pray according to his will, he answers your prayer 100% of the time. That's what he's saying here. Tim Keller put it this way. He, he said, if we knew what God knows... And we can know what he knows through his word. We can hear from his spirit and from other believers. If we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what he gives us. Another way to say that is when we abide in him, our desires become his and that's what we're praying. I want your desires. I belong to you. And he says, let's go. This is exactly what your life is about. So how do you know if you're growing? Look at the fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is anything that is of spiritual value. I can say it's anything that looks like Jesus. It's why he's cutting away. Anything, and it's painful. He he, he prunes us. He cuts away these wild vines that are running, our wild vines that aren't producing any spiritual fruit. But we're running after him. He says, nope, not that. That's going to happen. You're not going to produce fruit if that's there. You look at a vine dresser who knows what he's doing. You come alongside him after the after he's been through a you know a a vineyard. It looks like a mess. And sometimes our lives look. We think our lives look like that. But he said, No, no, no. I'm doing a good thing in you. And friends, he loves those he disciplines. If he's pruning you, it's because he loves you and he wants you to be more like Jesus. He, you're, he's helping you become more like him. But, but the, the pruning is cutting away our idols. And for most of us, it's love out of order. It's when good things have become God things. And that's true among most of us, like, you know, good Christian people. Um, we run after things that are good, but we make them best things. And he says, nope, I'm going to cut that out. Friends, here, here's the thing. Some of you are being pruned right now. If you feel like you're under the knife right now, I want to challenge you to think about the pruning going on in your life. And watch this. Every single day, common circumstances of every day in the details is the curriculum for sanctification in your life. It happens. It'll happen this afternoon. You'll have a choice. It'll happen tomorrow. And the things that we go through, we can either receive them. Lord, how, do I, how, how are you making... Making me more like Jesus in this. I don't like it at all. But how are you forming me? Because that's my goal. To be like Jesus. To bear fruit. Fruit looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruit looks like the fruit of the Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. It looks like people that you're impacting. It's anything of spiritual value. In verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Here it is. And so prove to be my disciple. You see that? Fruit is his grace expressed in its multifaceted ways. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's love expressed in multiple ways. And this is not, don't miss this, this is not just church activities. Like now you're doing the, the spiritual thing. No, this, all of life is spiritual. All of life is, is, is following him as a disciple. You bear fruit when you forgive someone who's hurt you. You bear fruit when you extend patience and grace to your spouse. You bear fruit when you lift up your roommate or classmate, and especially one that you don't really like very much. You're bearing fruit when you, uh, when you applaud a coworker and celebrate something they've done. You bear fruit when you pray for someone that you don't like a whole lot. When you pray for a politician you disagree with, you're bearing fruit and God is glorified. When we are like Jesus, this is everyday common stuff that requires grace. So everyday grace helps us grow. Everyday grace, look at this, brings joy. These things I've spoken to you that my joy, Jesus' joy, may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is crazy. Do you know this? Think about it. Jesus was the most joyful person who's ever lived. And he's saying, I'm going to give you my joy in you. This, again, organic relationship, source of the vine coming to us. 
I'm going to give you my joy. What is joy? We talk about this at Christmas time, right? Joy is not happiness. Happiness is happenstance. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy is being right in the center of God's will. How do you do that? Abide in him. It's being in the word. It's speaking truth to your life. It's being reminded of how much, you, how much you're loved. That's it. How much you're loved over and over again. Joy is then walking in that. Whatever comes your way. And it's, it is joy because God's doing a work in your life and he's doing it right now. If you feel like you're under the knife right now, you need to see that God is at work in your life and he's bringing his joy, even in the mundane task, the joy of your salvation, being, uh, being, you know, coming into your life and being seen by others. Everyday grace brings love. We'll land with this. Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. See, it sounds like, wait, you, you said that. You're kind of repeating this. Yes, it's love now that he's saying. We remain in his love. We stay in his grace. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Wow. So just as Jesus obeyed the father out of love, it's a loving, organic relationship. Now we can have the same relationship. Not a compliance to rules, but an inner dynamic and power that's at work in us. And it's all motivated by love. This is the Christian life. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments. Well, no, go on to verse 12. I'm jumping around here. This is my commandment that you love one another. Here's the word, as. Biggest little word in this whole passage. As I have loved you. We love as he loves us. Jesus comes and he says, I'm going to give you this kind of life. You're going to grow in me if you remain in me, attached to the vine, habits that keep you right here, centered, abiding in me. I'm priority in your life. I'm Lord of your life. Then you're going to grow in joy. You're going to grow in love. And this is the one thing he's called us to, friends. This is what I want you to hear today. I've, I've, I've offered this quote before because it impacted my life many years ago. I think it was in college when I read August 4th, from my utmost for his highest. And he writes this. This is Oswald Chambers. Listen to this. As Christians, we are not here for our own purpose at all. We are here for the purpose of God. And the two are not the same. We do not know what God's compelling purpose is. You often, this is often the case. We know his grand purpose. But whatever happens, we must maintain our relationship with him. We must never allow anything to damage our relationship with God. But if something does damage it, we must take the time to make it right again. I believe this is why God's called you here today. Then he goes on. Listen to this. The most important aspect of Christianity. Here it is. It's not the work we do. But the relationship we maintain and the surrounding influence and qualities that are produced by that one relationship. And then he says, that is all that God has asked us to give our attention to. And it's the one thing that is constantly under attack in your life. Is he right? Wow. One thing. And it's all made possible because of Jesus, the true vine. He was the one who was cut off. Isaiah 53 says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for this generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made, him his, made a grave for him with the wicked, and a rich man in his death, Although he had no, done no violence, there was no deceit in his life. He lived the perfect life, obeying God, fully connected to the Father, only doing what the Father told him to do, only saying what the Father told him to say. He was then cut off so that you and I would never be cut off, so that we could be grafted in to the family and into the source of life. And so, friends, if you feel like you're under the knife right now, you need to remember that all things that come into our lives, he's at work, and his pruning is out of love 
Because there's some things in our lives that need to go. And that's what he's up to in our lives. And so what I want to do, I want us to just close in prayer. If you'll just bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to pray together. We're not going to sing a song. We're going to just enter into a moment of silence before we head out into the week. And I just want to encourage you. We're all here. You know, the pruning can come just, just by circumstances. Decisions that we make when things come our way. Uh, some of it happens when we have not been obedient. Some of us are needing some pruning because we have followed after things of this world that are not making us like Jesus. He's going he's gonna to cut it away for our good, for your good, because he loves you. Because only as we remain in him, that's where the fruit is found. That's where we grow. That's where joy is found. That's where love is found. That's life. So what are you going to do? Right now, focus on him. Praise him for his grace and tell him. We're going to spend just a moment in, in silence. To abide, to remain in his love, to dwell in his presence, something we don't do nearly enough to practice what we can do this week. Tell him what, what do you need to tell him? Maybe it's thanking him, maybe you, how much you love him. But what are you going to do? What habits will you form? And say it, say, Lord, watch me, watch me. You tell him. Maybe you need to settle this thing of salvation and grace. And maybe you thought you're secure. Maybe you're questioning this apostasy, this, this thing where you can think you're a believer, proclaim that you are not, not be, not remain in him, not abide in him. You need to settle that today. And you can do that. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I respond not simply to go to heaven someday when I die, but to be your disciple now and to follow you because I know that's where the life comes from. It's where the joy, the love, that's where the growth comes from. So give him your life. Lord, we say yes to you. Some of you can determine to say yes to his command to be baptized. Do what many have done to come and say, yes, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Lord, we love you and we praise you for your grace. We live in it. You alone are worthy of our lives. We give you all that we are in Christ's name. Amen.